Hey guys, welcome to the Buck Brief. Matt Belinsky with us for the first time. He is a tech and media lawyer based out in L.A., host of the Prevailing Narrative Podcast. Matt, good to have you on, man. What's going on? Uh, everything and nothing, you know, just trying to keep up with the craziness going on right now. But, Buck, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, what happened at UCLA? I, there's these protests <laughs> on the campuses all over the place. Oh, I'm very familiar man. with the ones because, you know, I used to work at the NYPD. I'm very familiar with the Columbia ones and NYU ones. I've been on those campuses a lot. Uh, but at UCLA, there were counter-protesters. There was a fight. Yeah. Things got wild. What happened? Yes. Uh, UCLA was very unique in its regard here and, and kind of strange because people think of it as this idyllic campus in the middle of Los Angeles, of Westwood, of all places. So um, first, the initial protesters, the pro-Palestinian protesters, blocked off the main entrance to kind of the main campus building called Royce Hall. Um, they separate, set up their usual barricades and whatnot. And then a group of, I guess, seemingly counter-protesters, or at least it started with a GoFundMe to fund to have a large screen uh, blasting footage of the uh, October 7th uh, terrorist attack and other, you know, kind of noise that would disrupt those protests. And that's kind of how a bit of a counter countermeasure to that started. Um, then that spiraled into a bit of a, a more general counter protest with pro-Israel or, or anti-protester uh, voices participating there. Um, and campus administration, campus police did absolutely nothing in just jurisdictional terms here. This isn't LAPD jurisdiction. Uh, UCLA, the UC campuses, the only law enforcement, at least without further authorization allowed to conduct any law enforcement activities there are UC campus police. Um, so they decided to do nothing. Uh, these The encampment grew, the counter protest grew, and students at the initial protest, the pro-Palestinian protest, they went so far as to block off other entrances to other buildings um, with barricades, with gates, and were handing out wristbands to those that seemingly supported their cause or that at least passed scrutiny of whatever they believed were the ideas that, that would uh, uh, pass muster to get them into buildings. And once again, the university did nothing and sent out a message yesterday afternoon stating that they were taking these situations on a case by case basis. Then last night, um, after nightfall, the counter protesters started to lob some items in, I believe it was fireworks, um, some other stink bombs, some other items into the encampments. There was obviously a, ret a response retort from those in the pro-Palestinian encampments and things just spiled from there. And it went at least three and a half to four hours before any authorities, any law enforcement at all showed up. So it was pure chaos right in the middle of UCLA for about four, about four hours last night. Well, I, I got questions. I got questions. So first of all, uh, it lo I, I saw a video. It looked like a scene almost like out of out of Braveheart or something. You had like a, a wall of people with yes. uh, placards up, then people rushing into them and they're like trying yeah. to charge through the line and their fists flying and things got yeah. things got pretty fiery. Yeah, it was like Braveheart, except not noble at all. Um, it yeah. was it, the protesters at the initial encampment set up kind of makeshift umbrellas or cardboard to try to, yes, as, you know, uh, Scottish fighters of, of the seemingly Middle Ages would set up with steel, uh, with shields and steel, they would set up with cardboard and umbrellas. Um, and then, you know, the protesters are those who are trying to impede or, or, or break the, the perimeter of the camp, try to take the, t would try to take the umbrellas. Um, the fireworks were a nice touch. Uh, they certainly added some flair to the events. And there were stink, there were stink bombs? I didn't know those are still out um, there. They, they, you can find anything these days. God knows, yeah. you know, a little, little Amazon search, you'll find some stink bombs. Um, so that keep, and then it somehow became hand to hand, hand to hand combat at times because some people from the encampments would come out, they'd find fight the counter protesters. So it was kind of this, this tete a tete, this push, push and pull between whoever would exit the encampment, who would ever get caught uh, in, in, in between or in that no man's land where, where people were fighting and then would receive back into the encampment. And just, you've got campus police there doing nothing for about an hour and a half. LAPD showed up thinking about 4 a.m. and finally, uh, finally separated the two groups of protesters. Why was, why was the law enforcement in response just MIA for hours. Well, how, how can anyone justify that? Well, sure. Well, I think I mentioned the first jurisdictional justification was that LAPD doesn't technically have jurisdiction until it's called in at UC campuses. If we're looking for the explanation that says a little bit more about the general disorder or, or poor approach towards public order and public safety in the state of California and Los Angeles is that as opposed to the authorities and the administration in you know, Florida, University of Florida, University of Texas that say, you know, listen, we are going to prioritize 
uh, public order and the functioning of the, the campuses and the students that aren't participating in these protests and, and their campus life, uh, the UCLA and the California authorities <clears throat> have said, we, we don't want anything that could, any fallout, anything that does restrict the ability of these protesters to do what they're doing right now, we're not going to take the risk. We're not going to take the risk that the cops might have to use physical force to break up the encampments, might have to drag uh, students kicking and screaming away, as we've seen with so many videos. And I, I would imagine that because of the potential for bad publicity or bad visuals that would reflect badly on the constituents that the California uh, politicians find as their constituents is probably why they, hold, they held off. Uh, we'll get into some more of this in, in just a second. But first, from our sponsor, Oxford Gold Group. There's some people out there still in the fence about having some gold and silver on hand, and that just doesn't make sense to me. I've got gold and silver on hand. I think it is a part of a smart plan for the future. I mean, look at the reasons you should have it on hand. Uh, tangible currency, a bug-out plan if things get really crazy, portfolio diversification, hedging against inflation, and historically, it's a store of value. Gold increases in value over time. Now, if you're paying attention to global events and the debt, $34 trillion, you're probably thinking, good time to get some gold and silver on hand. Nobody can predict the future, but we can prepare for it, and that starts now. Call the Oxford Gold Group. They're the real pros. It's who I get my gold and silver from. You may qualify up to ten, for up to $10,000 in free precious metals. Call 833-995-GOLD. That's 833-995-G-O-L-D. 833-995-995. 995 gold. All right, we're back with Matt Belinsky here. Matt, uh, you're a, a, a tech lawyer, so you know how this stuff goes. What do you think about their trying to force this sale of TikTok and all the stuff around TikTok? Where are you on that? So I think it's an interesting battle between national security concerns and the First Amendment, um, because as we've seen, TikTok's made no bones about it. They've publicly stated they're going to challenge this on First Amendment grounds. Um, I think it presents an interesting edge case because what the government's going to say is we one uh, there there have been restrictions around foreign ownership of media for nearly 100 years now. I mean, the Communications Act of 1930 limited ownership of any any company that has a broadcast license, which at the time was primarily radio, soon became primarily television to 20 percent foreign ownership. So that's never really been challenged. However, it hasn't really translated to the Internet. So. The government's going to say, listen, we're not banning, we're not punishing the views specifically on TikTok. We're not punishing the content itself, we're simply saying that this is a national security concern and we're trying to control the ownership, which is something that has passed constitutional muster previously. What TikTok is going to say is that, uh, and, and they're going to point to some comments and some commentary from members of Congress that it, it, in kind of justifying the TikTok legislation saying, hey, we're concerned about the views being prioritized and that are popularized on TikTok. And so some of the members, of, some of the members of Congress, some of the government, some people passing this legislation might have put their foot in their mouth and making it tough, tougher for the government to uh, uh, to clear this one First Amendment wise um, with the Supreme Court. So what do you think ends up happening? I think the government's going to prevail. Eventually, the Supreme Court has generally been deferential to Congress in matters of foreign policy and uh, and and national security. And I don't think it's quite a strong enough First Amendment case because, once again, they're not banning specific points of view on TikTok. They're simply trying to shift They say, once again, you can express these points of view not only on TikTok, on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter. We just need it to be under different ownership to do so. Do you personally like TikTok? Just curious. Like, I actually find no. TikTok yeah, I, really interesting. I find TikTok, if you want, if you're waiting in an airport terminal, like, I can't read with people having speakerphone conversations and, like, sneezing on me and stuff, you know, in the airport waiting area. If you can put some headphones in and watch, you can burn through two hours, it feels like, in, in three minutes. No doubt. You're, just, you're just sitting there. I mean, it. I, I, I feel like I always tell people, if you're looking for a time warp, as in a time waster for your brain, which I only think is worthwhile when you're in a situation like waiting for like a, you know, waiting for a, a plane or a, you know, something mm. like that, man, TikTok, it, it just takes over your, it takes over your mind. You're sitting there just, you know, you know, steak, steak, real estate, puppy, steak, yeah. real, you know, you just look at stuff. You're like, this is great. Yeah, well, it's popularity is no accident, right? And it's also no accident that the other social media platforms are trying to replicate it. I mean, you look at it with Instagram. Instagram has essentially turned into a TikTok clone. It's all reels now. Uh, you don't really see content from your friends. You see content that has been popularized is either comedy or, as you mentioned, cooking or these passive kind of 
you know, personal interest videos of dogs or puppies or God knows what. And so uh, I can't say that I'm a big TikTok user myself, but I I'd rather not swim against the tide. So I understand this is what people are gravitating towards on social media. The social media platforms are acknowledging that and short form video content is what social media is going to be for the foreseeable future. Yes, I think it's no question. Um, come back and I got some questions about uh, about you as in your podcast and L.A. as well. Um, but first up, you know, AI based companies have had huge moves in the last year or so. Some of them have been basically propping up the stock market. I mean, if you look at how much uh, attention, focus, investment they've gotten from Wall Street. And there are people that are watching this very closely because there are still big moves to be made. And that's where Mark Chaikin comes in. Mark worked on Wall Street for 50 years before becoming a writer and editor focusing on picking the best stocks in specific sectors like technology and artificial intelligence. He has predicted on record some of the biggest shifts of the past decade. And Mark says some Americans are going to miss out on a critical turning point in the AI frenzy. He says there's a new dawn for U.S. stocks. He predicts dozens of companies will be impacted in just the next 90 days. He's agreed to share one of his favorite AI stocks to buy now with our listeners. But everything in a new presentation you can watch for free at 2024AIstock.com. That's 2024AIstock.com. Paid for by Chaikin Analytics. All right, Matt, uh, for, first up, um, what do you talk about on the Prevailing Narrative podcast? That's your show. Tell me a little bit about it. Yeah, so it's a breakdown of current events, whatever happens to be in the news cycle, but it's a bit of the conversation around the conversation, right? Because to a certain extent, current events are shaped by, in the social media and digital media era, about how people are talking about them. Is the way an event is being interpre interpreted, is it being interpreted correctly? What do the people on one side have to say about it? Uh, are there some falsehoods from one side or the other? Um, if people are asserting, and as they do very often these days, that there's an ulterior motive or some other explanation, right, to what's going on. You saw that, of course, a lot with COVID. Is that ulterior motive that's being you know, asserted? Uh, is there validity to that? Um, people like to call that conspiracy theories. I think that's a little patronizing of its own, but to a certain extent, it's whether or not, you know, it's almost fact checking conspiracies, but I'd say I'm a lot more receptive to a lot of conspiracy theories than a lot of the other fact checkers out there. Um, so it's that and, you know, interview series with people that I think are relevant, have interesting ideas on social sciences, politics, what have you. Are you a, an original L.A. guy or did you move there? Born and raised. You're you always you're the real deal. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, yep. Seen the whole how cycle. do you feel? So I'll tell you, I grew up as a New Yorker and I had a especially in my teenage years, because, you know, Beverly Hills, 90210. And then sure. before before that, uh, Saved by the Bell. And, mm -hmm. you know, you, you look at uh, at pop culture and I feel like uh, growing up anywhere in America, Los <laughs> Angeles, the nicer parts of Los Angeles and the, you know, the uh, broader environs was like American Nirvana. And I even thought about moving to L.A. about a decade ago. And now all I see is just things moving in the wrong direction. Everything in the news, things moving yeah. in the wrong direction. Is L.A. salvageable? Or is it still worth it even with all the problems, you know, the crazy homeless situation in Santa Monica and all that? Like, what? how do you come down on this? Are, are you going to be the last yeah. guy, last man standing, uh, saying that, you know, L.A. is worth it even if you aren't a communist? What do you think? Yeah, so that, that's been a question on a lot of people in my circle's mind. They're wondering if, I, Matt, ha, why haven't you moved to Miami already? Um, so L.A. is always going to have a lot of appealing characteristics. That's why it was a place that everybody always wanted to move, as you recognize, and as the, me and the people who grew up here, when we grew up, everyone wanted to move here. It wasn't even really an idea that's challenged. Um, California had th has, uh, in recorded history, three years of net outflow migration. 2021, 2022, and 2023. Um, so do the math there. It's the first time there's ever been more people leaving than coming here. Um, it still has a lot of great qualities. It's actually really interesting from a business perspective, but knowing the, the homeless problem uh, which we had under control by 2014, the smallest uh, volume of people living on Skid Row in 50 years has spiraled. It's been, uh, we've had 50% of the rise uh, in homelessness in all of America and California over the past seven years. And even though violence has temp tapered off a little bit since just a, a crazy rise in 2020 and 2021, it still feels like nobody's out there working for us. It feels like the government's actually uh, actively working against its citizens, and that's turned off a lot of people. Can that be salvaged? It's going to be difficult. The way, that the way that Los Angeles is set up, 
it's not just a large city, it's also a city within a county. So you don't just have to win some city elections, you have to win some county elections too. Everyone was very hopeful that if Rick Caruso uh, was elected mayor in 2022, that he'd be able to turn the city around and he lost. And even if he had won, there's only so much that he could do because you've got 14 city council members, some of whom are completely crazy. You operate within a county jurisdiction that has a board of supervisors, the board of supervisors is crazy. And what I've been trying to do partially with my podcast is get people in California, Los Angeles to refocus their attention on local politics because that affects your life just so much more. People were sitting there up until 2020, had no idea who their city council person was, had no idea who the district attorney was, no idea who the county supervisors were. Now some people are starting to pay more attention to it. Um, I think a key election, and I think personally the most interesting election in 2024 that's not national, will be the district attorney who's race in Los Angeles this year. We've got a guy named George Gascon. If you want to talk Soros prosecutors, he is the platonic ideal of a, of a Soros prosecutor. Soros gave him $2.5 million, one of the reasons he won in 2020, and he's made no bones about it that he thinks we have too harsh of a, a penal system, that we need to decarcerate, that the big, biggest problem in, in our society is that we're unfair to criminals, not that we need to protect innocent innocent civilians and LA and even a very liberal city with that like LA he's got like a 22 percent approval rating he's very unpopular however the person that made it through the primary against him is a guy named Nathan Hawkman I'm a big fan of Nathan's but he was recently a Republican he recently ran for California uh, state attorney general as a Republican so he's carrying a lot of baggage and it is going to be a dogfight everyone thought that Gascon's goose was cooked that he had no chance of winning until a recently Republican candidate came through in the primary against him so now you know if it all, all the political experts locally mm. were saying if there's anyone he can defeat, it would be this guy, Nathan Hockman, even though Nathan's fantastic. So it's kind of going to be a battle for the soul of L.A. and a little bit of a a you know kind of survey of a, a final word, or at least from a, a deeply blue jurisdiction on these Soros prosecutors, many of whom were swept into power in 2020. You know, Matt, I'm just telling you, we got beaches and beautiful women down here too in South Florida, my friend, you know, there, there are other options. I'm just letting you know, but I, I appreciate that you're a fighter for the cause. Uh, check you're out the, the prevailing narrative podcast with Matt Belinsky. Go check it out. And Matt, uh, we'll have to get you on radio soon, man. Thank you so much for joining. We'd love to. Thank you for having me.